In the late 19th century, a movement known as the Hebrew Roots was born. This movement teaches a wide variety of doctrines that differ from biblical Christianity. It is a complete shame, a complete shame, my friends, that the entire Christian world calls the Messiah by a completely bogus and made up false name. And I want you to get this, they know it. Many leaders in this movement believe and teach that a person's salvation is attained by the observance of the Sabbath, the dietary laws, and the keeping of the Torah. What do you need to do to be saved? What did Yeshua say? Keep Torah. Oh, I know people want to go and tell me what Paul said and how they want to bend and twist Paul. No, no, what did Yeshua say? Yeshua said, Keep the commandments and you shall live. Keep the commandments and you'll be delivered. Keep the commandments, you'll inherit everlasting life. Despite the fact that the writings of the New Testament were originally written in Greek, many within the Hebrew roots deny this fact and claim that the New Testament was written in Hebrew. Some of them will even say that no one can understand the Bible unless they understand the Hebrew language. Within the Torah observant community, there are many different factions and beliefs regarding the name of Jesus, Bible translations, and what is dictated as scripture. Some within the Hebrew Roots movement believe that the teachings of the Apostle Paul contradict the rest of the Bible. Some of them even say that he is a heretic and that none of his epistles should be given any authority. Even though the Apostle Peter testified that the words of Paul are scripture, the members within the Hebrew roots often discount the authority of Paul's writings. Oh, I know people want to go and tell me what Paul said and how they want to bend and twist Paul. No, no, what did Yeshua say? Many different beliefs are held on certain extracurricular books that are not included in the biblical canon. Some regard the Book of Thomas, the Book of Enoch, and the Book of Maccabees as part of the Holy Scriptures. Within the Hebrew Roots is a very popular sect known as the Sacred Names Movement. The members of the Sacred Names Movement believe that one must renounce the name of Jesus, keep the law, and call upon the name Yahuwah to attain everlasting salvation. This group has a very large disdain for Christians and is known to embrace the elements of Judaism as their foundation rather than Christianity. Did you know that the name Jesus is less than 400 years old? Where did this name come from and what was the original name of our Messiah? Jesus is false. It's a false name. They know it. Okay, it was created. It's, it's, just, it's no more than a, a few hundred years old. In this film, we will be taking a deeper look into the Hebrew Roots movement. In order to have a clear understanding of their beliefs, we will go face to face with their leaders, teachers, and some of their members to see clearly what they believe. Ultimately, we will see if the beliefs of the Hebrew Roots movement are based on the Holy Scriptures or if they're based on something outside of the Bible itself. My name is Matt Powell. I was in the Hebrew Roots Movement for almost two years and a lot of the doctrines that they taught people, what they hid on the surface and they wouldn't just come out and actually tell me what they believed. My name is David Dongera and I grew up in the Hebrew Roots Movement and 
thank God today I know the truth and looking hindsight I think that a lot of the things that I experienced and learned I think I can be a blessing to those that are still there today. That was a picture of the perfect Lamb, Jesus Christ, and His blood being shed for us. And when they would take the blood and put it over the doorpost, and the angel of death passed over them, that was a picture that if you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, the death is going to pass over you. Because the second death has no power on you. That was a picture of Jesus Christ. is their salvation at any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that name is Jesus, right? Jesus is the name above all names. The name that God has exalted above every name, the Bible tells us, is Jesus. Look at what it says there in verse number 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what name does the Bible tell us that we ought to use and that has been exalted above every name? And it's the name of Jesus Christ. Man, the title of my sermon this morning is The Old Testament Sabbath. The Old Testament Sabbath. Now, we do not observe the seventh day Sabbath in the New Testament. We don't observe any day of the week today as the Sabbath day where we don't do any work or have a solemn assembly on that day. We have church on Sunday, which is the first day of the week. And I'm gonna preach to you about why that is in this sermon. Now, there are people out there who want to get us to observe the Sabbath. And what this is, is the gateway drug into a whole slew of things, observing the Torah, Hebrew roots, and eating kosher food, and going down this whole long list until eventually you reach the destination at the end of that dark path, and the destination is Judaism. I know a guy who's going to school to be an Orthodox rabbi right now. I don't see how he couldn't have been at salvation when he talked about his childhood and getting into it. I don't think there was any doubt in his mind at one time. So he somehow forsook the Messiah. He walked away, whether his faith, I mean, you can argue maybe his faith was weak. Typically, the first thing that they come at you with is the Sabbath day. And the reason that they hit you with that first is because of the fact that they have a strong argument for it by saying, well, it's in the Ten Commandments. There's a inconsistency among, among professing Christians. They will protest at courtrooms <laughs> about taking down the Ten Commandments when they only believe in keeping nine. I'm gonna keep all nine, but that one, don't want to. The number one reason that the Hebrew Roots Movement believes that the Sabbath is for today is because it's part of the Ten Commandments. From a doctrinal standpoint because it is a commandment it, and it's also it's one of the ten commandments that's a big deal because the ten commandments was put in the ark it's a commandment it's the fourth commandment most people would agree that the old testament is done away but what people fail to understand oftentimes is that the ten commandments actually were the old testament now i'll explain that a little bit further in a moment but if you would go to deuteronomy chapter four Deuteronomy chapter four, we're gonna look up all three mentions of this term, the 10 commandments. It's mentioned three times in the Old Testament. The first was in Exodus 34. The next one's in Deuteronomy 4.13. The Bible reads, and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even 10 commandments. So he said, even there is a restatement. He declared the covenant, even 10 commandments. And so it's clear that the Bible is saying here that the words of the covenant were the Ten Commandments. 
2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, watch this. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, watch this, written and engraven in stones was glorious. Let me ask you something. What was it that was written and engraven in stones? The whole book of Genesis? The whole book of Exodus? Nope. Was the whole book of Leviticus engraven in stone? What was engraven in that stone? The Ten Commandments. And he says that the ministration of death was written and engraven in stones. And it says it was glorious. We're in verse 7. So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. Watch this which glory was to be done away. So the Bible says that that which was engraven in stones, being the Ten Commandments, was to be done away. Oh, they're written in stone, it's permanent. Well, I guess you forgot the part where Moses took the stone tablets and he broke them. He literally took those permanent Ten Commandments and he threw them on the ground and shattered them. You know what that pictures? It pictures that the best man, who was the best guy in Exodus? The best guy broke the Ten Commandments. That's why the Old Covenant is known as what? The ministration of death. But you say, well, that's Sabbath day. I mean, it's part of the Ten Commandments. So we got, look, if the law is changed in the New Testament, which the Bible says the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law, then guess what? Something about the Ten Commandments is going to change too. We do not keep the literal Sabbath day where we work six days and then take a day of rest. We don't do it. That's Old Testament old covenant and that is not commanded in the new testament the bible says in hebrews 8 8 it says for finding fault with them he saith behold the days come saith the lord when i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of judah and so a new covenant means that the stones that were written upon in the old testament that were the old covenant were no longer going to be the covenant that god would use god would use a new covenant not in the letter but in the spirit one of the things I saw in Christianity was, was a little bit of a selfish root in it. And the reason I say that is because everything was based on salvation. And that just kind of didn't really set well with me. I felt like there was, there was something more to achieve. One of the things I found, and, and I think most people that you'll talk to in the Hebrew roots, it kind of starts with the Sabbath. And that's why I'm telling you the Sabbath keeping is the gateway drug to keeping the whole law, to getting circumcised and eating kosher food and going down that road. And then eventually what they're trying to do is a bait and switch to get you from Messianic Judaism into just Judaism, synagogue of Satan Judaism. One of the things that the Hebrew Roots Movement tried to teach me was this idea that the Talmud was somehow the Word of God. And so obviously there are layers in the Hebrew Roots Movement and people in the movement that would say that the Talmud is wicked and praise God for that. But there are a group of people, specifically the Sacred Names Movement, that teaches that Jesus is a pagan name. You know, that's, that's serious. That's satanic. And in fact, one of my friends from the Hebrew Roots Movement told me, he says, Matt, he says, unless you deny the name of Jesus, unless you renounce his name, you cannot be saved. And that's when I realized that there was something severely wrong with the movement that I was a part of. We speak English, and because we speak English, we're going to call him Jesus. We're going to call him what the Bible says, Jesus Christ, the name that every knee shall bow. There is a law that we keep the Sabbath. And so when I don't have a desire to keep the law, then I would consider myself doomed, right? Because I would have permanent separation from the Father. People don't want to think of grace like it's earned, but it actually is. Um, this Hebrew Roots Movement, it's not just that, it's not that they just like the Old Testament and they just want to do things like the Old Testament. They believe by doing this, they are saved. And they will mask what they do and they'll say, it's just by faith. It's not of works. They'll mask it with that. So we are saved from our past through faith by believing on Christ. And then from our present to the day that we die and go home to be with the Lord, it's a faith plus work system. It's a faith plus work system.
You know, David, one of the things that I would say the Hebrew Roots Movement messes up right at the beginning is their foundation, and that is salvation. You know, the Bible clearly teaches that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone, and that we can't lose our salvation. Is salvation by faith or works? Again, I don't have a concrete answer to that. Man, that's an awesome question. I, I, wish, I wish that I could give you a solid answer, and, and I should be able to give you a solid answer. Um, but if you want to have eternal life, keep the commandments. Wow, that's such a big part of it. A lot of times people will say, well, they just believe Old Testament salvation. But I'm here to tell you, brother, they don't believe in salvation in the New Testament. They don't believe in salvation in the Old Testament. It's always been the same salvation. You know, it's always been through grace and by faith alone. And Psalm 89 is a perfect place that shows us in the Old Testament that God would never break his covenant with his children. Now, we may break the covenant, and the Bible goes on to say in Psalm 89, verse 30, If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. So God's saying, look, I will not suffer my faithfulness to fail. I have made this promise and I'm going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. So God is clearly saying that he will not break the covenant, nor alter the thing that has gone out of his lips. Our present to the day that we die, it's a faith plus work system. We have to believe on Christ and keep the commandments that have not changed. We can't atone for our past. But from our present to the day we go home to be the Lord, it's faith plus works. That's basically what salvation is. None of us know what it truly means to be saved. I just have to completely die to the person who I was in order for Christ to live through me, or I have no hope. And now as I continue to keep the Sabbath, then I feel confident that in the end, He will save me. But if I don't, how could I trust in a prayer that I said that I didn't even mean? And I don't think that the Hebrew Roots Movement should cause us to want to prove salvation through the Old Testament either. This is obviously a very strong point that it's even in the Old Testament. But I think the New Testament should be enough to prove that salvation was always the same. It was an everlasting salvation. We can go to many Old Testament passages. We can go to Isaiah 40, 41. We can go to Psalm 89 and so on and so forth. Show examples of people, men of God, that fell out and then that still went to heaven. King Saul is primary example of a man that in the Old Testament, where he believed on Jesus. The Bible says that God gave him a new heart. And obviously we know King Saul, He's, he was a, a, a byword, right? He was a proverb because of such, a, such a, a failure he was of all the things he did. And at the end, we know that the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 28 says that tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. And obviously we know Samuel's in heaven. And so prophet Samuel looks at Saul and says, you're going to be with me. And we know that Saul proceeds the ultimate sin in people's minds to kill himself. So that would take all, all doubt that this guy may, might have repented at the last moment. The last thing he did was commit suicide. The last thing he did was kill himself. And so according to Prophet Samuel, he's with him right now. And so we could go on and on about these things. But at the end of the day, the New Testament should be our final authority about salvation through Jesus. And so if you could lose your salvation, then this passage in the Bible wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. And so, you know, obviously Saul fell on his own sword and committed suicide, probably one of the worst sins ever. But the Bible says that he's with the Lord right now. He's in heaven. And anybody that's put their faith and trust in Christ Jesus is eternally saved. A lot of the strong principles, a lot of the strong teachings of salvation, of the gospel in the Bible are in the book of Psalms, the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, and so on and so forth. Truthfully, the Bible does not teach a once saved, always saved theology. It's not like a light switch. One day you're lost, one day you're, one day you're saved. People look at it like that and it's not true at all.
being saved is a process that is not completed until the end. At any time in your life, you could fall and lose out on everlasting life. I think it's this thing that we all learned in Christianity, or at least those who came through Christianity, is this idea of being saved. One of the main leaders of the Hebrew Roots Movement is a man by the name of Steve Berkson, and he did this 17-part series called, Are You Saved? And in his series, he went on to say several times to his audience, just within the first few minutes, um, that there's no assurance of salvation and that no one is saved. Now, anybody that's read the Bible knows that the Bible clearly says that we have been saved, we are saved, and the Bible says nowhere that we are being saved, you know. But these guys say, well, we're being saved. Well, show me that in the Bible. They can't. And the reason is, is because it's not there. In fact, the opposite is true. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, are saved, it is the power of God. So we are saved. It doesn't say that we are not saved or that nobody's saved. The Bible clearly says that we are saved. In our King James Bible, uh, we read many times as we are saved. I want to read to you uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. It says, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. For by grace are you saved. Romans 8 says, For ye are saved by hope. You are saved. You by are hope. saved by hope. Yeah. And so there's no question about it. And Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. He says, And I know them and they follow me. He says, And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. So when we're saved, Jesus says we have eternal life and we shall never perish. You know, the woman that touched the hem of Christ's garment uh, in the New Testament, she said, hey, if I can just but touch his garment, uh, the hem of his garment, I'll, I'll be healed. I'll be whole. And he looked at her when she touched the hem of his garment and he said, daughter, be of good cheer. Thy faith hath made thee whole. You know, so with Steve Berkson, how could anybody say, well, be of good cheer? No one is saved. Be of good cheer. You've been made partially whole. <laughs> right. The Bible tells us that salvation is only by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well then, therefore, we are saved the moment we have that faith, the moment we believe and call upon the name of the Lord. Well then, we are saved at that moment. The Bible makes it very clear. John chapter number 3, verse number 36 uh, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And so it says that we have it, you hath everlasting life, meaning you have it right now. Jesus himself said, John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And so at that moment that we believe, we are already passed from death unto life. Do I believe I have eternal life or it's something that I get later? I can't give a, a yes or no uh, answer to that. Uh, I believe if I was to drop dead right now, yes, I will be in the kingdom. Yeshua will let me in. People like Michael Rood or, or people like Steve Bergson, they, they haven't understood what a promise means. They haven't understood what a promise means, let alone a promise of God. The Bible says he can't lie. And so that's the assurance right there. If God promised it, which the Bible says in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God has promised to us eternal life, the Bible says, and this life is in his son. So if God has promised us eternal life, how sure can you be of that promise? How certain are you of that? Are you going to think that God's a liar? He doesn't lie, the Bible says. So to lose your salvation, it involves all those things. You reject the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't, you don't endure unto the end. You receive no chastening for your sin. And lastly, you're not keeping the commandments still applicable. 
and we can only keep these commandments through the Lord Jesus Christ in perfection. If we don't do that, why should he, why should he accept us? Well, if they can't even get salvation right, if the Hebrew Roots Movement cannot understand the gospel of Christ, the very foundation of our faith, why would we trust them for anything else? Yeah, why would we trust them to tell us the name of the Savior? Why would we trust them to, to say what we should wear in church or how we should look in church or what we should do in church? They're not even saved. The Spirit of Christ doesn't dwell in them. Another one of the strange doctrines of the Hebrew Roots Movement is this idea that circumcision has some part in salvation. But the Bible is very clear that salvation is by faith alone without the deeds of the law. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. It takes a circumcised heart along with the flesh. No one will enter the kingdom unless they are circumcised of heart and of flesh. No one will enter the kingdom unless they are circumcised of heart and of flesh. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. And these certain men which came down teaching that, Paul calls them in the book of Galatians, false brethren crept in unawares. These people who came down. Notice they're just certain men which came down from Judea that taught this garbage. He calls them false brethren in Galatians chapter 2 when he refers back to this. So basically, the Apostle Paul would call Zach Bauer a false brother, crept in unawares. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing if he's teaching this garbage that you have to be circumcised to be saved. Even the casual reader of the New Testament knows that you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So the Bible tells us here in the New Testament that we are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. And so if we were to be circumcised with hands physically, then this verse wouldn't make any sense. Why do I believe once saved, always saved is a nonsensical doctrine? Well, there's a number of reasons. For one thing, we should be moving on to other more important issues. I don't think it's easy to walk away from your salvation, Matt. I think it's, you know, it's got to be a very conscious, uh, conscious, uh, willful decision. One of the things that I noticed during an interview with one of the men in the Hebrew Roots Movement was this idea that God would actually abort his children. And this guy even said, look, God will do a spiritual abortion on somebody that doesn't remain in the covenant. Nobody's completely born again in terms of us being finalized till the day that we die in Christ. We are conceived spiritually in Christ. And we are developing as we grow in the Lord, as we grow and we mature in learning God's commandments and learning how to follow Christ and crucify the, the, the flesh with the lust thereof. And God in his foreknowledge, if he sees this person is not going to cut it. At that point, whenever God chooses to, he says, I'm done. You are now aborted. We saw from God's word that those of us who are saved are in the covenant, whether we like it or not, because God said he will not break the covenant. It's God who holds us in his hand and says, I will not let my children go. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It's God that said those words. So it's man's wisdom that says that God will abort his children. It's the wisdom of God and the power of the cross that says, once we're saved, we're always saved. God has every right to abort anybody who is conceived in Christ if they do not in endure. Think of uh, the, the, the King Saul in the Old Testament. He started off fine, but then he started to mess up. Brother David, when I was first introduced to the Hebrew Roots Movement, one of the things that they had told me several times was that they believe in salvation by faith alone and that you can't work your way to heaven. But I remember one evening, um, I was sitting with some of my friends, and one of them, he was an older man. He was probably about 60 years old. And he looked at me, and he looked at everybody. He says, you know what? He says, I know that we have said that 
keeping the Torah, the commandments, is not a part of salvation. He's like, I know we say that, but who are we kidding? You don't hear any of them telling you that the gospel is salvation by faith alone and that it's not of works and that it's just believing on Jesus Christ that saves you and that you can't lose your salvation. They teach that if you don't do the deeds, if you don't do the works, if you don't keep the commandments, that you're going to lose your salvation. So the texts do say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But what does it really mean to believe? To really believe means to obey. To really believe means to obey. One of the major doctrines that the Hebrew Roots Movement teaches is the idea that faith and works are actually the same thing. They say, well, if you have faith, that means that you have works because faith and works are the same thing. But the Bible says in Romans 4, 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth. So we see a distinction between belief and works. So you could say like faith is actually doing the work. Exactly. It's always funny how these work salvation teachers, they always want to try to change the definition of faith to somehow include works. Well, that makes Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 meaningless. If he sits there and says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're saved by faith, not of works. So how can faith and works be the same thing? Or how can faith include works when it says in Romans 4, 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. It's him that worketh not, but believeth. He's saved. And they say, well, you know, if you have faith, it'll include works. Okay, let's back up. Him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. The pat answer would be, you know, Ephesians 2.8, that we're saved by grace through faith. Um, the question of then becomes, what is faith? And that's where there's a bit of a divide between the Hebrew roots and Christianity, I think, is what establishes faith. So this doctrine of the Hebrew roots movement where they say works and faith, they're the same thing. Works and faith, your works are because of your faith or whatever cute way they want to package it. It's just completely foreign to scripture completely foreign to the New Testament. And in Romans 11, 6, it says, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. And so he puts it two separate opposite things. If it's grace, then it's not work. If it's work, it's not grace. Do I think it's possible to be saved and do not do any works? Not forever, no. I think you eventually have to make a decision here and start being obedient or not. So no, I don't believe that. There was a man in the Hebrew Roots Movement who told me, hey, if you go out to reach people with the Torah, they'd never say with the Gospel, they'd never say with Jesus. They say, hey, once you get seasoned enough in the Torah to go out and reach people with the Torah, which is found, no, that idea is found nowhere in the Bible. But he says, once you become good enough to do this, he says, make sure you use Jesus' name to reel them in first. Because if you say the name Yeshua, that will, that will cause them to doubt you. That will, they'll, they'll think that's weird. Use the name of Jesus just to get them in. And once we have them in, we can slowly start telling them that his real name was changed and that his real name is Yeshua. And so that's the sign of a cult, is when somebody can't be straightforward and honest and say, well, I believe in Yeshua. They slowly introduce it by using Jesus' name. So instead of using Yeshua, let's say with somebody out on the street, you might use Jesus' name right. first. Always. Yeah, always I will use the name Jesus unless I'm with a, a Hebrew Roots Fellowship, then of course I'll, I'll say Yeshua. But if I just use the name Yeshua or Yahweh or Yehovah or however they pronounce it this week, it's important, um, but not as important as drawing folks in. So does that make sense? I mean, it's more yeah. like, I would rather try to gain someone's um, interest and desire to meet Jesus than to push them away by using a name they're not familiar with. And if the name of Jesus really is Yeshua, don't we believe that the Savior name has power? Why is it that we have to go to a door to, to, to preach the Torah and we can't tell them the name of the Savior? We have to use, in our opinions, some counterfeit name in order to draw them in and then tell them the real name. 
shows that there's no power in what they're preaching. It shows that it's not the true name of the Savior. And so I like to start there and then say, oh, and by the way, did you know his Hebrew name was Yeshua? And why that's important? Because Yeshua means God saves. For those of you that are in the Hebrew Roots Movement, one of the best ways to know you're in a cult is when certain information or, or certain beliefs are being withheld from you until you've gotten deeper into the religion or deeper into the cult. And the Hebrew Roots Movement is one of the best examples of withholding certain beliefs and withholding certain information until the perfect time when they can really deceive you. I know you and I had already talked about this and, and I don't have any judgment towards you because this is all I knew my whole life growing up. Um, but I, I think that Jesus means hail Zeus. I refer to him as white Jesus now. There's no greater strategy for Satan than to attack the foundation of our faith, the name of Christ. And so if Satan knows that there's one name that we can call on to be saved, it's obvious that he would do everything in his power to attack that one name. Did you know that the name Jesus is less than 400 years old? Where did this name come from? And what was the original name of our Messiah? When you say, that the name of Jesus is the wrong name. That's an attack on the Greek New Testament because that's where we get the name Jesus. We derive it from Isus in the Greek New Testament. And if you're gonna say that the Greek New Testament is wrong, then all of Christianity just went out the window because Christianity is built on the foundation of the New Testament. So if you say, well, the New Testament wasn't written in Greek or the Greek New Testament that we have is wrong, we have no foundation. For, uh, for 30 years of my life, for 30 years of my life, um, I used to love quote unquote white Jesus. It's not really his name. We both know it's not his name. I don't think it's a proper translation. And when you go back to the Greek being um, I-E-S-O-U-S, um, Iusus was in reference to Helios or, or Osiris um, being Zeus. I don't think that, that we have a perfect translation left. Um, it's just the way it is. Um, I think that we have parts. The Greek New Testament is the foundation of Christianity. And if you don't believe that the Greek New Testament is authentic, then you are left with nothing. All these scriptures in one way or another are kind of marred, but I'm thankful that we have something um, that we can dig through. If Satan can get us to doubt the Bible, the foundation of our faith, the Word of God, then he could get us to believe anything. And even right at the beginning, when Satan deceived Eve in the garden, Satan looked at her and he says, Yea, hath God said, can you really take him at his word? And so that's what the people of the Hebrew Roots Movement often have to go towards is they say, hey, we don't have a preserved Word of God, and so therefore it's all speculation and yea, hath God said. In my 40 years, 40 years of studying the scriptures, now I've come to the conclusion that um, they're not perfect. I think that Madith Yahu was written in Hebrew. There's a lot of those letters or scrolls, Megillahs were written in Hebrew. Matthew was originally written in, in Hebrew. One of the main focuses of the Hebrew Roots Movement is this idea that there's something special about the Hebrew language. And they even go so far as to say that the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew. The reality is there is no evidence to prove such an idea. 22 of the New Testament books were written specifically to Greek people in Greek places. And so therefore we can conclude that they were writing in Greek and not Hebrew because those people that they were writing to were Greek-speaking people. Every single book in the New Testament mentions the name of Jesus. If you look at the titles of the books, it isn't hard to figure out that they're primarily written to a Greek-speaking audience. You've got the book of Romans, you've got first and second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Where are these places? Okay, well, obviously we know Rome is in Italy and had a heavy Greek influence 
a great Greek speaking population there, as well as Latin, of course. Then you have Corinth, a city in Greece. You've got Thessalonica. All of these different places are in the Greek speaking world. Then you go to the book of Revelation. And who is it sent to? The seven churches in Asia or Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. Greek speaking places. They're written to Greek speaking people. You've got the book of Luke written to Theophilus. You've got the book of Acts written to Theophilus. You've got Romans chapter 16 where the Apostle Paul goes down through a list of his friends and friend after friend after friend has a Greek name. Sosthenes, Silvanus, Timotheus, and there's Yeshua. It just makes no sense at all how we can call all these Greek people by their name that actually lived in this area and then there's just this one man that's called by his Hebrew name. And so it would make no sense if Jesus living amongst all these Greek-speaking people in the Roman Empire is to be called as Yeshua. You go to the book of 2 John, 3 John, you'll see John bringing up Greek-speaking people as his fellow laborers, as his fellow church members. And so it's crystal clear in the New Testament that it's being addressed to a Greek speaking audience. That's why we know that the New Testament was written in Greek, aside from the fact that there are almost 6,000 manuscripts of it written in Greek, zero manuscripts of it written in Hebrew, okay? So if the New Testament was written in Greek and consistently the name of the Savior is Jesus, in German, that's Jesus, in Spanish, that's Jesus, in Greek, it's Jesus, in English, it's Jesus. It's not Yeshua. This book, the Greek New Testament, never says Yeshua one time. It never contains the Tetragrammaton one time. It says Jesus and it calls God the Lord. So it's clear that you'd have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to believe that the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew. Brother Matt, we have to understand how crucial this doctrine is. Because the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So it's crucial to understand the name. If we have two names at risk right here, if we have the name of the Savior being put to, to test by these demonic Hebrew roots movement teachers, if the name of the Savior being put to the test whereby we are saved, it's a very dangerous doctrine. So to say that the name of Jesus has only been around for 400 years isn't just an attack on the translations of the Bible, it's also an attack on the very foundation of the Bible, the actual Greek manuscripts. And that is the end game of this Hebrew Roots movement. It's actually to get people into Judaism. It's to get people to reject Christianity and go to Judaism. It's the gateway drug of Judaism. Okay, they want to get you to have doubt in the New Testament, doubt the Greek New Testament, doubt the name of Jesus, doubt its authenticity. They want to get you all excited about the Hebrew because what they really want you reading is a Hebrew Old Testament and that's all they want you to accept. They want you to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it comes down to. And the people that are behind this are Jews, they're crypto Jews that are trying to get people away from Christianity and into Judaism. In 2017, Jews for Judaism, an organization that focuses on Jewish outreach, published an article about how the Hebrew Roots movement is creating a plethora of new converts to Judaism. They have put their stamp of approval on the Hebrew Roots movement and often advise Christians to become a part of the Torah observant community. The vast majority of people who are converting to Judaism or become B'nai Noach come from the evangelical movement that is messianic. And like, okay, we have to go to Jersey to learn more about Jews and use Jewish lingo and la la la, Yeshua HaMashiach and all this stuff. And the similar organizations are, are responsible in large measure for the massive amount of conversion to Judaism Jewish rabbis have used the Hebrew roots as an indoor 
to get the masses to convert and to deny Jesus as the Messiah. But the evangelicals are like learning Hebrew, learning things about Judaism, and they're very curious, and they're adopting things. They're adopting things that are not even biblical, that are rabbinic traditions. They adopted it flying all over the place. And this sparked a tremendous interest among these evangelicals in, in Judaism, and the masses and masses of conversions are from them. Even though the members of the Torah observant community insist that the feasts of old apply in the New Testament, the Bible clearly says that the meats, drinks, diverse washings, and the carnal ordinances were imposed on them until the time of Reformation. This means that when Christ came, the shadow of the Passover was fulfilled. While most in the Hebrew Roots movement realized that Jesus was the final sacrifice, some of their members will still offer a lamb on the Passover to complete their observance of the feast. Of course, the New Testament speaks against this and says that Jesus Christ was offered once for all. The Bible clearly states that the dietary laws, feasts, and the Sabbath were fulfilled by Christ and are no longer to be observed as part of the New Covenant. Even the Apostle Paul stated that we are not to be judged in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. These things were a shadow of Christ and with the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Why does the Holy Bible have to be 66 books now? when obviously there was a book of Jasher, and there obviously there was a book of Enoch. The book of Enoch is a ridiculous book. It, it hasn't been taken seriously throughout history because of the nonsense found therein, such as giants that are 450 feet tall. It talks about giants being 300 cubits tall. Well, when the Bible refers to giants, it gives their proportions as being around nine or 10 feet tall when you have examples like Goliath or Og, the king of Bashan. There's a big difference between a guy being nine or 10 feet tall and being 450 feet tall. I mean, that's just ridiculous. And you know, you've got the sons of God and the daughters of men supposedly producing a child that's gonna grow to be 450 feet tall. I mean, that's straight out of the weekly world news. I mean, that's just crazy. That's going to be a C-section for sure. If you're reading the book of Enoch, think to yourself, why are you reading it? Have you even read the entire Bible? Why are you seeking out extra biblical literature? It, feel, it feels good to, to shake things that, that uh, I used to believe in and now I know that they're not true, you know, and especially the, the names were just a major part of that. It's a major part of that. We are built upon the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So again, going back to the foundation, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He's the foundation of our faith and practice in all matters of our life. Nowhere in the Bible does it say Jesus is our Sabbath. And they say, well, uh, well, no, Jesus is our Sabbath. And, I, and I've asked people on fa Facebook, show me book, chapter, and verse where it says that. They won't show it to me because it's not there. The Hebrew Roots Movement will say, well, if Jesus kept the Sabbath, then I've got to keep the Sabbath too. But this passage will blow their minds, right? Look at John chapter 5, verse 15. This is a time where Jesus Christ healed uh, um, somebody on the Sabbath day. The man departed, that's the one they, they, Jesus Christ healed, and told the Jews that it was Jesus which made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. 
So Jesus did actually heal this guy on the Sabbath day. Did Jesus work on the Sabbath? But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. My father worketh hitherto, and I work. I work. Now, why did he say that? Because of the fact that the Sabbath pictures the fact that Christ does all the work for salvation, and we just rest in the finished work of Christ. He does the work, and we rest in his finished work. That's why when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was dead for three days and three nights. Guess what those three days were? The first day he was dead was the 14th day of the month, Abib, the Passover. Guess what happens on the Passover? You're not supposed to do any work. The second day that Jesus was dead was the 15th day of the month, Abib. Guess what that is? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. And guess what? You're not supposed to do any work on that day either. The third day that Jesus was dead was a Saturday or the regular Sabbath day, the seventh day. And guess what you're not supposed to do on the Sabbath in the Old Testament? You're not supposed to do any work. So the first day that Jesus was dead, you don't do any work. The second day that Jesus is dead, don't do any work. Third day that Jesus is dead, don't do any work. Why? Because Jesus, death and burial and resurrection, he did all the work. Amen. You just sit back and rest as Christ saves you. Christ does it all. We don't work our way to heaven. We trust in and rest on the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Amen. Now, look, if I would have been around in Jesus' day and I started working on the Sabbath, that would be a sin, wouldn't it? Because back in the Old Covenant, they were told, do not work on the Sabbath. So if you were in the Old Covenant and you worked on the Sabbath, wouldn't that be a sin? But why was it not a sin for Jesus to work on the Sabbath? Because Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And guess what? He doesn't need to picture like, oh, well, I'm supposed to rest in someone else's work. He's the worker. He didn't rest for, you think he was resting in peace for those three days and three nights? No, he was paying for our sins. He was dead for three days and three nights. And he rose again with the keys of hell and of death. And he wasn't relaxing down there, friend. He was doing the work that gets us to heaven. Jesus did the work to get us to heaven, we rest in the work. That's what the Sabbath represents. Resting in the finished work of Christ. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. Now, some people might think, that seems a little bit harsh. The man was just picking up sticks on the Sabbath day when he should have been resting, but did that really warrant the death penalty? Well, you have to understand what God was trying to teach by instituting the Sabbath to begin with. Think about this. He told the children of Israel, you must rest on the Sabbath day. The man who picked up sticks, the man who worked on the Sabbath day, he earned a physical death for himself. Just as sure as if you work for salvation when you should be resting on the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished for you at Calvary, then you'll earn a spiritual death. The Bible refers to it as the second death, hell. And this is why the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter number four, starting at verse nine, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. So the reason why the Sabbath day was instituted in the first place is to teach a spiritual truth. The point is that if we work our way to heaven when we're supposed to be resting in the finished work of Christ, we're not going to be saved. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. He was put to death because he was working when he was supposed to be resting. And so that's a picture of salvation. When we put our trust in Christ, we cease from our own works and we rest in the finished work at Calvary. This is why the Bible tells us in Colossians chapter number two, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. And then it says in verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, 
but the body is of Christ. The Sabbath day of the Old Covenant was a shadow of things to come. It was a shadow of the fact that now in the New Testament, we rest for salvation on the finished work of Jesus Christ. The Sabbath day has been done away with because Jesus already accomplished what he came to this earth to do at Calvary. He already died on the cross and was buried and rose again. The work has been done. Our role now, what God expects from us in response is to rest on that work. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 that if you rest, if you enter into that rest, that you've ceased from your own works. Jesus is the sacred name. Jesus is the name above all names. There's power in that name. You know, when you go to a school, you know, they outlaw the name of Jesus. You know, you can take that name in vain, but when it comes to using that name seriously, people get offended. The Bible says that Jesus is a rock of offense. One of the main things that really upset me, I think, was the attack against Christians. I would see, again, on social media, on Facebook, I would see just these horrendous sort of, you know, like memes that are posted on Facebook. And most of them were very, very anti-Christian. I could wear a t-shirt into school that says, in college, that says Yeshua right on it. Nobody would give a care. In fact, they would probably say, hey, this guy's cool. He's a religious zealot of some sort. But the moment that you claim the name of Christ, the Bible says that you'll suffer persecution. And Brother Dave, I remember, <clears throat> I remember being in a room of people back when I was in the Hebrew Roots Movement. One by one, this group of people, my friends, started to deny Jesus Christ. They started out by denying his name, and then they went to denying him even existing. And um, I had begged my friends, I said, look, you guys don't want to go down this route. You don't need to deny Christ. You need Christ. He's the Savior. He's the only source of salvation. But in that room, one by one, people just started to deny Christ. And finally, it got to me. And it was my turn. And I just remember looking around and, and thinking to myself, I can't do this. You know, I'm saved. He bought, the Bible says you're bought with a price. And I just said, I can't. I can't do it. And before I left that day, um, you know, and obviously they asked me to leave because Jesus is offensive to them, and he still is. The main leader of their group looked at me and said, Matt, you'll never amount to anything preaching in the name of Jesus. And he said never to come back. You wouldn't amount to anything by preaching the name of Jesus, yet the name of Jesus still is in the world 2,000 years after, right? You never mount up to anything, yet the name of Jesus is what divided our two eras, right? Before Christ, after Christ. As soon as I saw the name Jesus being sort of slandered, if you like, I that's when I really took a step back and I thought, no, I don't like this. I don't like it. There's something about that name that is very precious to me. And that's the end game of the Hebrew Roots Movement, is to get people to deny the name of Jesus, deny Jesus, deny that he was the Messiah, and go so far as to say that he didn't even exist. So it's just a, tr it's just a bob sled down. And people in the Hebrew Roots Movement need to understand that a lot of it seems very friendly on the surface. A lot of people in the Hebrew Roots Movement, a lot of the teachers, they put on a kippah or a yarmulke and they put on tzitzits and they try to make themselves look really nice and really harmless to people, but a lot of times the most harmless looking people can be the most dangerous. The Bible says the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And so whenever they keep the Passover, it's like the veil is still over their head. They can't understand that God gave the Passover to show them, hey, redemption happens once. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I think it's important for people that are new to the Hebrew Roots Movement that they understand that they don't have this attitude 
of, hey, Brother Matt, I don't know what you're talking about. This is this is completely foreign to what I know. They're not like that. They haven't made me do anything like that. It's very important that they understand it's coming soon, that these cults and these secret religions, that they slowly feed you with little by little, little by little. And if you're asking questions to your leaders, your, your church leaders or whoever, and they seem to be skeptical about answering you, you have a textbook case of a cult in your hand. I would rather try to gain someone's uh, interest and desire to meet Jesus than to push them away by using a name they're not familiar with. It's important, um, but not as important as drawing folks in. For circumcision verily profiteth, we'll see, it profiteth. Well, what's it profit? Look at what it says, if thou do what? If thou keep the law. Let me ask you a question, who here has kept the whole law? So does it profit you? No, it doesn't profit you unless you have kept the whole law. Guess what? Therefore, every human being on the face of the planet, circumcision doesn't profit us. For the circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made what? Uncircumcision. So if you are trusting in your circumcision to save you, you're trusting in that, but then you break the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. You know what the Bible is saying? You're not saved. You're going to go to hell because you're trusting in your circumcision to save you. And that's what the Hebrew Roots Movement teaches, is that you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. Look what it goes on to say in this chapter. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of whom? But of God, do you realize that if salvation were by circumcision, you are literally not only trusting in yourself, but you're trusting in some man to do it right, and you're trusting in that man to save you. If Satan can get us to doubt the Bible, then he knows that he has the victory. That name is Jesus in English, it's Jesus in Spanish, it's Jesus in German, it's the same name of the same person. The Bible never says Yeshua in it one time. So are these people using the Bible as their authority? Say, well, they're just going back to the original. No, original Greek doesn't say Yeshua either. So where are these people getting this? These doctrines are not the doctrines of the Bible. These are the doctrines of man. My friend, do not be deceived by just anything that you read on the internet or any video that you see on YouTube that tries to tell you that the Lord is not his name. His name is the Lord. His name is the Lord God. And our Savior is known as the Lord Jesus Christ. In English, Jesus. In Spanish, Jesus. In Portuguese, Jesus. Jesus is a name by which we stand. Jesus, Jesus Christ is our Savior. They'll say that we have not been saved. And basically, what are they teaching? They're teaching that salvation is a process. Now, that would make sense if salvation were by works. It says, he that believeth on the Son, what's that word? Hath everlasting life. Now, is that saying that you're going to get it at some point in the future? No, when it says hath, it means that you have it right now. It's not some process. We're not waiting to the end of our life to receive everlasting life. No, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, at that point, you have it.
Hi there, my name is Aaron Thompson from Sure Foundation Baptist Church, and I just want to talk to you for a few minutes about what the Bible says it takes to go to heaven. Now, the Bible is very clear that there's four things that we have to understand. And the first thing is that we all have to understand that we've sinned. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And what sin is, is the transgression of God's laws. So when we lie, steal, murder, anything like that, the Bible calls that sin and it's breaking God's commandments. And so we've all done that. The Bible says we're all born into sin. The second thing you have to understand is that the the sin that we commit, there's a penalty for that sin. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Every person has to face the facts that we're going to die someday. And the Bible also talks about there being a second death. And a lot of people haven't heard of the second death. But in Revelation chapter uh, 20, verses 14 and 15, it says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And in verse 15 it says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so that's not very good news for humanity because it, the Bible is very clear that anybody that's not written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. And that ultimate destiny that you have to go to is hell. And the Bible says that there's certain types of people that go to hell. In Revelation chapter 21, verse number 8, the Bible says this, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters. It's a pretty bad list of sins. And not everybody's committed all those sins, but the Bible says, and all liars. See, you don't have to be super wicked to go to hell. You just have to be a liar. And everybody's lied. So the Bible says, uh, continues on in this verse and says, And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the second death is being cast into the lake of fire, and nobody in their right mind would want to go there. But the thing is, is that God loves us, and He doesn't want us to have to go to the lake of fire. So He made a way for us to escape the fires of hell. And He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, on this earth a little over 2,000 years ago, and he was born in Bethlehem's manger, and he grew up a sinless man. But the thing about Jesus is that not only was it he a sinless man, but he was also the Son of God, and he was God. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the express image of God's person. And so um, the Bible teaches that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And that teaches in 1 John 5, 7, that there is a, a Trinity. And in that Trinity, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so Jesus Christ was not only man, but he was also God. And the Bible says, since God, so since God was his Father, the Bible teaches that he was born without sin because God cannot, cannot sin. The Bible says Jesus started to do all kinds of miracles. And he raised Lazarus from the dead. He walked on water. And uh, he healed the sick and the blind and the maimed and the halt and the lepers. So Jesus Christ, after performing all the miracles that he performed, was hated by some and he was taken and he was tortured uh, for, for a whole day. And the Bible says that he went through a mock trial where they tried him and, and brought false witnesses against him. They beat him, they spit in his face. They spit in the face of God, the Son of God. And they uh, put a crown of thorns on his head. They beat him, they, um, they, they tortured him. And then they crucified him, they nailed his hands and feet to a cross and as he was hanging on the cross, the Bible says that the wrath of God was poured upon him for the sins that we've committed. And when he was on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because Jesus became sin for us on the cross and took our place. And it's, it's all the things that we have done. It says, 
if he did them. He took our place, he switched places with us. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So Jesus Christ was prophesied to come and die for the sins of the whole world. And, you know, many people believe that you have to do good works or uh, be a good person to be saved. But the Bible doesn't teach that at all. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so God gave Jesus Christ as a gift to humanity to die for the sins of the whole world and to redeem mankind unto himself. And the Bible is very clear in that verse. It says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So if you believe in Christ, then you have eternal life. That's what the Bible says very clearly. And there's many, many verses that say that belief alone is what takes you to heaven. In Acts 16, 31, the Bible says that there, there was a Philippian jailer and he came to Paul and Silas while they were in prison and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, this is the only time this is ever, this question's ever asked in the Bible. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now, it doesn't say be a good person and thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say go to church and thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say repent of all your sins and thou shalt be saved. It says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And so the other thing you have to understand is that once you believe in Christ, the Bible teaches that salvation's a gift. It's not something that you can earn. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So a few things that you have to understand about that verse also is that salvation is, is, is by grace. See, God gives you salvation for your faith in Him. And faith is not works, and works is not faith. Faith is completely separate from works. Faith is something that you believe, and you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. So, and then also, the Bible says it's not of works, lest any man should boast. So if you could say, hey, I believed in Jesus, and I also had great works, those works are not going to get you into heaven. You have to put 100% of your faith in Jesus and 0% on yourself. And so it's completely not of works. And also, the Bible says that it's the gift of God. And so you have to understand that salvation is a free gift. And so you can't earn a gift. A gift is something that somebody gives to you for free. Otherwise, that's by very definition that a gift is free. And so you have to understand that God is the one that did all the work for you to be saved. Jesus is the one that, that took the tremendous torture and died on the cross. He was the one that was buried. He was the one that rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And if you put all your faith in him, that's what saves you. And he did all the work to pay for the gift. And he says, I want to give you eternal life. And all you have to do is put your faith in me. That's it. And that's very simple. That's very easy. So if I was to say, I, I'm going to give you this Bible as a free gift, and, but you have to pay me 10 cents for it, would that be a gift? No, it would not be a gift because you're paying for it. If I said I was going to give you this Bible as a free gift and I said, but you got to go wash my car, that would not be a free gift. That would be working for it. And if I said, I'm going to give you this Bible, but you have to read it all. And then a week later, I'm going to come back and check and see if you read it and you haven't read it. I'm going to take it back from you. That would also not be a free gift because I'm attaching um, stipulations for you to keep the gift. So a gift is free. It's string, no strings attached. And so it's very important that you understand that salvation is a free gift. And in Romans 6.23, part B, the Bible says very clearly that, um, well, the, the beginning of that verse says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So 
you have to understand that it's a gift and that you get it from Jesus and that it's eternal life. And if you understand that, and that you can't lose it no matter what you do, then you are saved. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you put all your faith in Jesus, he gives you eternal life as a free gift. And the Bible says if you call upon the name of the Lord, you ask Jesus to save you, he will. It says whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say you might be. There's no stipulations. There's no uh, things that you have to do past that. Once you put your faith and trust in Christ, you are saved and you get everlasting life. But the Bible says you must call upon him. You must ask him. Even though it's a free gift, that doesn't mean that you don't have to ask. You still have to ask for it. So if you just pray something like this, Dear Jesus, I know I've sinned. I know I deserve hell, but I'm asking you to save me and take me to heaven when I die. Grant me the gift of everlasting life. If you just called upon the name of the Lord and trusted in him as your Savior, the Bible says you are saved. And we'd like to know about your decision that you trusted Christ. If you wouldn't mind sending us an email, we'd appreciate that. And we'd like to be a blessing to you. We thank you for watching this video and God bless.